Okay, let's bring that music down a bit. And I think we're ready to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we are going to be looking at the art of A.Y. Jackson, Alexander Young Jackson, one of the most important, influential Canadian artists of all time, and really the organizing force behind the famous Group of Seven. The Group of Seven is the most famous art group in Canadian history by far, um, as well as really the 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 the, the group that that really brought to the attention of Canadians the need for a Canadian approach to painting and more broadly the importance of Canadian culture establishing identifying and establishing what is unique about Canada versus anywhere else in the world particularly our neighbors to the south um, the United States of America um, because even to this day, there's still questions as what what does constitute Canadian identity? And this is something that A.Y. Jackson, as well as the other members of the Group of Seven, thought a lot about. So this is, I'm really excited to do this painting. This painting, uh, entitled Aurora from 1927, um, is, I think, one of my favorite paintings of all time. And this is, despite what it might look like on the screen right now, a painting that is achievable even by a total beginner. So I'm going to show you step by step by step how to create a painting just like this. And let's get started right now. Okay, so uh, if you're watching the video long after it's aired, you can use the timestamps below to jump to the parts of the video you want to go to, including going right to the very, very end of the video, which will be about two and a half hours from now. Um, we're going to get started by putting some uh, the image onto the canvas. I'm going to show you how to do that. Then we're going to stain it with a little bit of color. Then we're going to take a little break while that dries, and we're going to talk about the biography of A.Y. Jackson. Then we'll do, I don't think we'll do an underpainting, we're just going to go right to the background and then the foreground, finish the background, finish the foreground, boom, we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison, and then you can tell me what you think of the results. So, uh, maybe before we do that, I just want to encourage everyone to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you know when upcoming videos are going to take place. Once a month, I go through our Facebook group and I find all the images that you guys have posted once you've joined the Facebook group and I give people feedback on how to improve their art. So join the Facebook group. There's a link in the description below for that. I would love to see your version of today's painting as well as maybe something else you're working on, something that's passionate, uh, that, that brings you excitement and passion. Uh, another painting or drawing uh, and as well if you want to leave a donation there's a few ways you can do that there's a PayPal link below you can use the super chat function here in YouTube or you can contact me through my face for, through the Facebook group or my website either one okay so after we've got that done let's now get this image onto the canvas and there's a lot of different ways we can do this we could just sketch this out but sort of my preferred way of doing this uh, um, for these classes is using this template which I've created and which you can download for free so there's a Dropbox link in the description below I think it's like the second uh, sentence in the video description and that's going to take you to this folder and you're going to see there's lots of folders within the folder you're going to have your most basic paintings the intro painting series at the top and the uh, the various different guides and things associated with that. And then this next series that all begin with a letter, these ones are all our most base, basic paintings. And then the more, a little bit, slightly more complex paintings are down below here. There's, you know, hundreds of them uh, down there below. But our focus is, you know, one of our introductory paintings here 
and we click on that that number Z01 or whatever it was. Uh, and here we've got four files. So let me just walk you through the files that are in that Dropbox folder. You have the original painting itself. Uh, and this is the highest resolution version of this painting I could find. And I'm not even sure exactly where this painting is at the moment. There is two versions of this outline, a JPEG and a PDF, whichever one you want to use to print out on your home printer. And then this little cheat sheet I created with a little bit of information on, on some color mixing suggestions. So once you've downloaded your template, let's bring that back up. We're going to transfer it onto the canvas and I'll show you step by step how we do that. So here I've printed it off on just a regular sheet of paper and I'm going to transfer it onto this canvas. This is a nine by 12 size canvas board, right? It's canvas stretched over a piece of uh, wood or cardboard. And then it usually comes pre gessoed, but I actually gesso it again and then I sand it down so that it's even smoother uh, because I like a super smooth surface to work on. You don't have to do that, but that's just my preferred way. I really like painting on a surface that has as little texture as possible. And I'm going to use some tape here to tape this down. I think just right in the middle is good enough. Okay, and to get this image onto the canvas, I'm going to use carbon transfer paper. You can use graphite paper, and you can see you can use this over and over again. Do you think I can get one more drawing out of this? Let's see, I think we can get one more. Um, you know, you can use, you know, buy a pack of that uh, paper, carbon paper, at your local art supply store or dollar store or even fabric stores, because that's how. Um, People who are designing clothes or using patterns transfer that pattern onto fabric before they cut it and sew it, right? Um, and if you go to a fabric store, you're often likely to find more than just a black, but, but multiple different colors, especially white. So I'm just going to quickly transfer this here. I'm not too worried about getting all the little squiggles and... Um, in the right place. Uh, because after all, my goal is not perfection. Um, I'm using these artworks by these great artists as inspiration and also to help convey some basic information about painting and specifically painting with um, acrylic paint. Uh, if you've watched some of my earlier videos that I made a few years ago, I did used to draw the can these images out, um, but we would end up spending the first 45 minutes of an episode drawing, and often what I'd hear from people is, ah, I'm not really happy with my painting, it doesn't really look like the original. And even if I would say, well, you, you painted it perfectly, maybe even better than the original, yeah, maybe the drawing wasn't perfect, but the painting is perfect. Most people really don't see the distinction uh, or care. They're like, it doesn't look like the original. I'm not happy. So this gets us about as close to the original as possible. So. I'm going to keep this. I, I often like to have that just a little bit off camera just for myself to refer to. And I think, I think this one's okay to be retired. That's, we've got about 10 or so paintings out of that one sheet of carbon paper. I think it's okay to, to say goodbye to. <laughs> okay. Wow. Lots of people in the chat and a whole bunch of new names here. So I'll get to that here. Um, maybe after I'm done this next step. Okay, so we've got our image onto the canvas. Let's apply some color on top of this in the process that, that goes all the way back 600 years to what the Italians called 
the imprimatur. You you must say it because it's a it's the funnest word to say. Imprimatur. We are. It literally means the first layer of paint, right? Or the bit. Or you could think of it as a priming the canvas for the other layers of of paint that we're going to paint on top of it. And just before I start painting it, I just want to let you know the paint that I I use. Now I'm not paid or sponsored by anybody. I went and bought m this paint just like everybody else does. And it's considered to be sort of an um, intermediate student grade paint. So I think it's the best bang for your buck in terms of price and quality. So the color I'm about to use here is this Azo Yellow Deep, and I call it a warm color. Um, because you'll see we've got two yellows, two reds, two blues. The system we're using here is called a split primary palette. So we're splitting each quote, quote unquote primary color into two, a warm and a cool. And that allows us to get almost every single color that the eye can see. The only ones that we really struggle with are, you know, our hyper fluorescent colors that are, um, you know, super, super unnatural. And we've, I've never seen the need to, to, to use those colors personally. But anyway, if you don't want to use Amsterdam paint or you don't have it, you could use Golden. This is probably one of the highest grades of acrylic paint that you could get. Um, and these are the same, these are the colors I would suggest you buy if you want to use Golden. Liquitex, this is their student grade. They have a professional grade as well. Uh, Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, and one I don't recommend here is this Museum Color um, out of Toronto because all of this paint, uh, the color has a little bit of white mixed into it, which makes it impossible for us to make a black, as you will see today. We're going to mix a black, and we don't without. I mean, you could certainly go buy black, but even if you're trying to mix these colors, you're always going to find that they're a little bit dull once those colors combine. So if you have problems like that with your paint, let me know so I can also not recommend it and put it into our art hall of shame. <laughs> so um, let's get this paint out and start painting. So I'm gonna use my warm yellow. And I'm going to put some, oops, let's, sorry. So I'm taking my warm yellow, that Azo Yellow Deep, I think it was. Put a little bit of water in there, maybe just about half and half. Now, this is the only time I ever use water with my acrylic paint. Um, many people do. I would say a lot of people do, but, but technically you're using the material wrong. And, you know, as soon as an artist hears that something's wrong, they're like, okay, I'm going to make that. I'm going to do exactly that. No one's going to tell me what's right and wrong and how to use my materials. Least of all, some guy on YouTube. But um, just think that you use water to clean your brush, right? So whenever you mix water into your acrylic paint, you're literally breaking down the binder that holds the pigment together and and binds it to the canvas. So in this instance, it's not so bad because we're painting uh, this acrylic right, or th this paint, this uh, imprimatura, right onto the, the um, gessoed surface. And gesso is essentially plaster. And uh, it's, it's plaster and an adhesive, acrylic adhesive. So it stains really well. So actually the water can actually help it permeate that surface. Um, so, but other than that, I would encourage you to use me other mediums to mix into your paint if you want it to be thinner and more fluid-like, or you can literally use fluid acrylics. And if that's not fluid enough for you, you can use acrylic inks. Right, and I've talked about all this stuff before in some of the very, very first episodes of the 
Master Studies series, but I have obviously know that there's lots of people that haven't watched that and have no intention of watching that, so there's always a little bit of a review for each one of these episodes. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly, before I move on here, just give a quick shout out to all the people watching. Looks like there's Posh Kaleen says, uh, I hope I won't be asleep when it starts. <laughs> Kathy's there. Hi, Kathy. Uh, um, Posh Kaleen is in bed under the quilt watching. Eamon says, it's 1 a.m. here in Egypt. Welcome, Eamon. Um... Let's see, there's Paula, or Ace, as, as Paula likes to, to call herself here on YouTube. Um, there's Lolly there from England. M. Taylor. Um, pa Lolly says, I can't paint this one tonight. It's fireworks time over here, and my dog is in the berserker mode, so I'm just quietly watching while I try to settle him down. Oh, it must be, uh, is it Guy Fox night? No, is that Guy Fox night? I thought that was earlier. Well, maybe. Must be, obviously. <laughs> Fireworks are going off in England right now. Um, Deborah's there. Hi, Deborah. And Rick is watching as well. That's great. Uh, Eamon says, my first time watching a live video, but I've, I've been doing the drawing course on this channel. That's so exciting. And Nikki's there. Hi, Nikki. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're doing well, too. Okay, great. What a great group here. So, uh, let's put this aside. Let's let this dry and move on. So, our next step here is I want to talk a little bit about who A.Y. Jackson was, Alexander Young Jackson, and, uh, and, and really the influence he had not just on painting, but on Canadian culture in general. So as again, just a reminder, join the Facebook group. So A.Y. Jackson, let's go up to the top here. So A.Y. Jackson born in 1882 in Montreal, Quebec. And for, for maybe those outs, and, and he was, uh, he's an English speaker. I'm sure he knew a little bit of French being in Montreal, which might sound strange because I think now today we think of Montreal as a, as a very French Canadian city, which it always was. But at one point, um, Montreal was the, the, the center of business and commerce and culture in Canada. Uh, and Toronto was a much smaller city than, than it is today. So uh, A.Y. Jackson really kind of grew up in the center of cosmopolitan Canada. And, uh, and there was also a large English-speaking population in Montreal. There's, there still is, but but obviously less so than, than there was at the time he was there. And uh, he M Montreal was the the center for uh, for culture. You had really the best art schools and uh, museums were all centered in Montreal. If if you were some someone who wanted to 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 can do something big and spectacular within Canada, you would go to Montreal to do that. So uh, he's born there, uh, and at, at, the, at the young age, I think it was five or six years old, his father left the family abruptly and just disappeared, leaving um, Alexander Young Jackson, Ale young Alexander and his family and his mother to put food on the table and pay the bills. So one of the things that he was able to do is get a job in a lithography company. And lithography is uh, a, uh, a printing process like silk screening um, and was very calm. The, it's probably it's, it's most, the, the, the uses for lithography back in the day would be making posters and advertisements as well as transferring reproducing photographs in on into plates that could be then used in newspapers and uh, magazines and things in the day so uh, that process i'm not exactly sure what his role within the lithography company would have been but he would have had a lot of experience probably going in and out of the dark rooms that they had because they would expose photos onto plates and then you'd sort of etch the image out um, and, and prep it for, for printing. But 
spending time in this type of, of uh, graphic design um, firm uh, clearly exposed him to not only all of the, the mechanics of printing, but a bunch of professional designers and artists. So, you know, you can just imagine being a young kid in that environment and you're surrounded by all of these uh, artists in Montreal, many of whom are probably some of the, the best artists of the time who are working at that company. That would have been, you know, I mean, I, I would love to have been a fly on the wall and just seen how all of those guys, because it would have been an all-male workforce except maybe a few female secretaries back in the day. Um, that would have been, you know, a pretty exciting place to be because Canadian art back then and arguably still to this day is not, um, it's not a, you don't go into making art in Canada to make money to get rich. So probably a lot of the artists who were working there, that was their, basically their day job. And then at night they'd go home and make paintings. And so this the same situation is the same sort of situation that, uh, A.Y. Jackson's best bud, Tom Thompson, later found himself in um, in his late teens. But that's a whole other story, right? Um, so anyway, one of the things that the the young Alexander Young Jackson does is he he starts to kind of he's obviously interested in art. He he works on several boats that are going across the ocean back and forth between England and uh, Paris back and forth Nova Scotia and maybe New York and um, eventually saves up his enough money for him to go to Europe and stay in Europe and he takes classes in Paris at the uh, L'Académie Julienne and L'Académie Julienne is really one of the most important art schools in in Europe but particularly in France at that time rivaled maybe only by the L'École des Beaux-Arts uh, L'Académie Julienne is, is where a lot of uh, famous French artists studied. And also, a lot of artists from abroad would go there to study as well. Because just like today, a lot of art schools like the university I teach at, you know, a, a great deal of the bottom line is funded by international students who are paying four or five times the tuition to be there, right? Um, I think I might have talked about this, some of this stuff before, but, you know, while he's there, he befriends a few other artists, uh, including this guy, Eric Spencer McKay, who, uh, or, or Mackey, I think, um, who's a famous New Zealand artist, and the two of them go on expeditions around Paris. They often go up north to, um, the, uh, to, to, you know, the, the north shore of France, uh, to this little area called Atop. And Atop, um, ironically, is where A.Y. Jackson finds himself about 10 years later in, in the midst of World War I, right? So I think um, that must have been quite the, the shock to have gone to Europe and study painting, you're shoulder to shoulder with great artists from all over the world, and you're going on these expeditions with your newfound friend from New Zealand. You're going up to the countryside in the North Shore of France and you're painting these beautiful seascapes. And then he goes back to Canada and he settles in Quebec. And just to kind of jump forward a little bit, he comes back to Europe for uh, when he enlists in, in the Canadian uh, infantry and he finds himself in the exact same place but now it's full of <clears throat> craters and the trees are torn to, to the stumps and shreds and there's <clears throat> corpses and, and uh, wrecked machinery and buildings everywhere. I think that must have made a, a, a huge and horrible impression on him. The, the least of which really, you know, probably reminded himself at moment to moment about his own mortality. And we'll come back to that and how I think that situation led him to form the group of seven. Uh, but anyway, so he comes back to Canada, settles back in Montreal where he was born and raised. And he's, I think he finds himself, so this is like 19, when does he come back? 19, 
think it was like 1912. Uh, so he comes back to Canada, as it says, goes to Montreal, and I think he's just really, he gets really depressed over the state of art in Canada at that time. He's just spent time in the Paris then, and arguably still to this day, is like the capital of art. And he's gone to the Louvre, he's gone to the Musée d'Orsay, he's seen all the masterpieces by all the great Impressionist painters, he's met some of, some of the friends of Monet who are still alive, who are teaching and painting. And then he comes back to Montreal, and it's kind of a bit of a culture shock for someone who's from Montreal. It's like, oh, nobody here seems to really care about art. Everyone's talking about art in Europe, but come here and nobody cares about art. No one's supporting the art. Most collectors in Canada at the time are, would prefer to buy paintings by European artists um, f from Europe or even art made by Europeans who've come to Canada. Like those are the things that, that the wealthy people in Montreal have on their homes. And they're like, oh, have you seen this painting by such and such famous academic uh, French or German artist? But they would have no Canadian artists because that would sort of look like you're some country bumpkin. Like who would, like who would hang some painting? Like if you're a wealthy Canadian, it would be almost embarrassing to, to hang a painting by a Canadian artist on the wall. Like it would be, you know, like uh, serving your your dignified guests McDonald's cheeseburgers. Like that's like you want to show that you're a, a you know a worldly citizen. So Canadian art was seen seen as very regional and uh, immature non-advanced, retrograde, or, you know, like sloppy, all that thing, any kind of uh, adjective you want to use to, to uh, describe Canadian, negative adjective you could use to describe Canadian art at the time. N I'm not saying that it was, there was lots of great artists um, that we're going to look at in future episodes who were busy making work, they just weren't selling art. Anyway, so A.Y. Jackson comes home, he sees what's going on, and he just gets really depressed, and he just thinks, well, there's no way I'm going to make a living as a Canadian artist in Canada. I think I'm going to move. Where should I go? Well, New York is kind of blowing up right now, and it's much closer. You know, if Montreal to New York is, is you know, like a four-hour train ride away. That's kind of... That, that's not a bad trade-off, and there were lots of other Canadian artists that had done that, including uh, an artist we painted a while ago, David Milne. He kind of went to New York and then kind of settled in the, in the countryside outside of New York City, but you know, we still have to this day a lot of Canadian actors, for instance, go down to the United States to find work and then maybe come back to Canada or live in Canada um, after they've become successful. Um, but... Words, uh, one of the things that happens is this artist, J.E.H. MacDonald, who is one of the members of the Group of Seven, sees um, this painting by A.Y. Jackson at an exhibition in Toronto. And this painting is called The Edge of the Maplewood from 1910. And so this painting um, causes, gets... J.E.H. MacDonald and all of his buddies that include Tom Thompson and Arthur Lismer and Lauren Harris, uh, they all go specifically to this exhibition. This is just one painting in an exhibition of dozens and dozens of other artists that was held at the Toronto Public Library. And it stood out like a sore thumb. And all of these guys are crowding around it saying like, who on earth is this guy? This guy's awesome. So J. H. McDonald writes him a letter and says, "I love your paintings. Like, uh, we're we're all there's a bunch of us here in Toronto who are really interested in doing something special. We're, we want to try to create a uniquely Canadian art, and we see your painting and think, how do we get this? Let's get this guy involved. And A. Y. Jackson, who's sort of feeling a little bit lost, kind of says, hmm. Well." I don't really feel wanted in Montreal. Um, New York is kind of a big, strange, something very different. But here, I've, I'm wanted in Toronto. There's like a bunch of guys in Toronto that set, think I should move there. So he does. He moves to Toronto. And um, 
he be he befriends all of these artists, many of whom later go on to form the Group of Seven, uh, including the artist Lauren Harris. And Lauren Harris, uh, who's we're going to be making a painting of his next week. Lauren Harris is um, he he was. He was basically from a very wealthy Canadian family, the, uh, a um, uh, kind of farm machinery uh, a family that, or, that had developed all this machinery and had become very wealthy. So one of the things Lauren Harris does is he builds this building that uh, has the very creative name of the studio building in Toronto. So Lauren Harris uses his money his um, his uh, inheritance to build this building, which still exists. It's a National Historic Site. It's not a particularly unique building, uh, from my opinion. It's just it looks like a big, you know, rectangular block. Um, just uh, um, anyway, I was, maybe I was going to find the map and all that stuff, but you could easily look it up. The the studio building in Toronto, like right in downtown Toronto, and he gives. Uh, a studio to A.Y. Jackson. In fact, let's, we've got to find the studio building. Okay. Uh, so here's, you know, a photograph of the studio building. I mean, purposely built with these gigantic windows because he knew that there were, he intended for artists to be in this space. And one of the things that Lauren Harris does is he invites really the, the best artists in Toronto to occupy different studios in this space. And... Um, uh, because he knows that people like A.Y. Jackson are leaving Canada to go to Europe and go to the United States. And he's like, how do we keep th these great artists in Canada? Let's build them a building. So A.Y. Jackson is given a studio to share with Tom Thompson. And Tom Thompson and A.Y. Jackson become fast friends, uh, a, a, a relationship that is re really only lasts one year, um, but because of this, they're, they're literally work, living and working in this small studio together, they, uh, they they form this really intense bond. They do go up to Algonquin Park several times to go make paintings together, and Algonquin Park is where many of the, of the, the artists who become the Group of Seven have spent a lot of time painting. It's a, it's a large, massive provincial park the size of like some states in the United States, and it's uh, um, uh, just this massive source of creativity for these artists. And uh, it's soon after, soon after the last trip they go to Algonquin Park together, him and Tom Thompson, that World War One breaks out in 1914, and. Uh, Back in the day, that was actually kind of seen as an exciting um, uh, news story. For a lot of young men all around the world, the idea of going to war was a very romantic idea. The possibility of, of running around in your costume and shooting guns um, was sort of seen as like this you know, rite of passage. That might have been what war was like a hundred years before World War I, but by the time World War I rolls around, it's no longer like playtime. It is a meat grinder, and um, it is within, within about six months of A.Y. Jackson making it to the front lines. He's shot, and he's, he's hit in the shoulder, and he's sent to the hospital, the, the, the Allied hospital in Etap, which again is where he had spent a summer before painting seascapes with his friend from New Zealand. So now he's laying in an in, in a army hospital in Etap, and, and he just, again, it just must be just this, like, what has gone, this world has gone mad. I, like, two years ago I was sitting here painting on the, and it was just this idyllic, uh, landscape and now it's just ruins. He's then transported to England where he uh, recovers in a large army base um, sort of on the the southern tip of of uh, the British Isle there and 
Um, it's during that time that A.Y. Jackson is recovering from his injury that he finds out about the death of Tom Thompson, which is a kind of earth-shattering experience for him. Uh, Tom Thompson didn't go to World War I. He stayed back in Canada for reasons we're not sure of to this, to this day. There's lots of speculation as to why, that, why Tom didn't go to war when many of his friends did. Um, from Tom had bone spurs just like President Trump or he was an anti-war activist, or that he did try to um, uh, volunteer for war twice and was turned down. I mean, th there's lots of myths about Tom Thompson, which is why I'm, I'm currently working on a graphic novel about Tom Thompson. Anyway, uh, long story short, um, just as... AY, so AY gets this awful news, and then within a few days finds out that he's being sent back to the front lines, and literally moments before he's he's shipped off back to, to France to fight in the trenches, and he would have been sent to the 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 to some of the, the worst areas of fighting, like Passchendaele, uh, which becomes one of the most famous battles in Canadian history. Um, he instead is invited to participate as a war artist um, by Lord Beaverbrook. So Lord Beaverbrook is kind of a, a famous Canadian entrepreneur, and uh, he puts all this money up to 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 assemble a bunch of artists to document the experience of the troops in World War One. And A. Y. Jackson is. Um, invited to become a, a participant in this program, and he he d he does some of his greatest work in uh, during World War uh, One. So like um, this painting, which sort of gives you an idea of what the landscape looked like um, in and around France and where he had spent a few of his summers just a few years before. Um, I'm just going to kind of jump a little bit forward here. So after after uh, AY returns from World War One, he um, he's he's obviously still uh, traumatized by the death of his good friend Tom Thompson. And, you know, clearly aware of his own mortality and the fragility of life and feels it's very important to, uh, that it's urgent, there's an urgent need for him to do something to, to bring to the, the attention of the public the, the unique vision that Canadian artists bring to the world. So... He, all of those friends that he had met back in Toronto who invited him to come there, J.E.H. MacDonald, um, the original group of seven, uh, was J.E.H. Uh, MacDonald, Arthur Lismer, Frank Johnson, um, A.Y. Jackson, Lauren Harris, Franklin Carmichael, uh, and, and Varley. Did I mention Varley? So you have these seven artists who form the group, and then of course, over as time goes, some of these guys leave and other people join up. Um, and so over the next few months, we are gonna be making paintings by every single member of the group of seven, of which there were, I think, 10 of them, <laughs> ultimately. Uh, other people who often associated with the group of seven were Tom Thompson and Emily Carr. Uh, it, Tom Thompson, was he exhibited with the group of seven on their first exhibition in 1919 although he had died two years prior but they did leave a chair an empty chair in the museum i guess there's not a photo of it but there's uh, they left an empty chair for tom to as sort of um for the spirit that kind of haunted the group over time Another artist who is often associated with the Group of Seven but is, was never a member is Emily Carr, who we looked at a few weeks ago. Emily Carr um, is really the most important artist in Canadian history, the most famous Canadian artist. And again, while she wasn't a part of the group, 
uh, A.Y. Jackson um, and uh, Lauren Harris often ref you know, referred to her as, as basically an honorary member of the group, and she also exhibited with them many times. Um, the, the Group of Seven actually only lasted for about five years before folding, um, and uh, very shortly after A.Y. formed the Group of Seven, he, and he was sort of like the, the organizer behind that movement, so much so he, like, that he then he also formed another group, the Beaver Hall Group, which was really a group of artists that were based in Montreal and Toronto, so trying to bridge that gap. Uh, one of the things about the Beaver Hall group is they also had a lot of women participating in that group, which was something that the Group of Seven had not done. And you know, I I, I suspect probably one of the reasons why he formed that group might have that might have been one of the reasons is that some of the other guys in the group were like, I don't know, A Y really women? You you want women to be part of this group? Like, I'm okay if Emily shows her paintings, but. Really, I don't, maybe I'm, I. I don't know. I'm just speculating because then, Ay is like, hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna form another group, and that group, I'll. I get to tell decide who's gonna be in that group. I'm gonna let a bunch of women in that group, um, as well. Later on, he forms another group, the Canadian Group of Painters, um, which is a massive kind of uh, cooperative of artists that, that I think has maybe like 50 or 60 artists, maybe about a, a, a third of which were also women. And that was a group that kind of spanned across the entire continent. So AY is very aware of, of the, the beauty of the Canadian landscape. And it is obviously the source of a lot of their painting, but he's also very much aware of the fact that, that the Canadian, the, land landscape and its massive vastness is also the thing that that has hindered Canadian artists for generations because it's hard for them to communicate when people are spread out all over from Vancouver to Toronto to Halifax Winnipeg you know there's there, they tend to silo themselves into these small little groups and it's also becomes very hard for collectors and curators and art writers, critics, to to follow the careers of any of these people because there's so little contact between them. So by forming these groups, they can then exhibit in and have these traveling exhibitions that move across the country, and that immediately sort of helps spread this idea that, yeah, there is something unique about Canada, and Canadian artists are uniquely uh, disposed to um, uh, to reflect that what that Canadian identity is, and that literally is one of the greatest contributions um, in Canadian art history, or just Canadian cultural history um, uh, in general. Um, and then maybe oh, so also kind of around during the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. A.Y. Jackson also does, he travels extensively across Canada. So he's spent, you know, grows up in Quebec and Montreal, spends some time in Toronto and, and goes to kind of, they consider northern Toronto to be Algonquin Park. But he becomes fast, he wants to go to the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. And he spends time um, in and around Banff and Lake Louise. He goes to Vancouver and Victoria. He's hiking mountains. There's a great video that the National Film Board of Canada did back in the 1940s that shows him, and at that time he would have been in his like early 60s, and he's climbing mountains, and he's got his, his paintings strapped to his back, and he's, he's making paintings in Alberta. And uh, it gives a sort of great romantic portrait of the artist as adventurer. Um, but... Uh, so today's painting that we're going to do today is is not exactly sure, but likely inspired by one of these trips up north. Um, he did go to uh, to the Arctic Circle in uh, and uh, uh, into what was what is now the Northwest Territories, and uh, he yeah. So he was he was just a sort of a big fan of 
the Canadian landscape and trying to document, you know, all aspects of it. Uh, and I think what's great about uh, A.Y. Jackson as well is that he makes a point of not just pa making paintings of, of uh, Canada during the summer, which, you know, Canadian tourism always wants to, to show pictures of of how Winnipeg looks like in the middle of summer and people on, you know, canoes paddling around and fishing and uh, the great forests and hiking and camping. Um, but the reality is in Canada, as some of you watching right now know, the majority of the time in Canada, it is very cold and there's a lot of snow on the ground and uh, so one of the things I, that I think is really special about A.Y. Jackson and the other group of seven members is they're, they're, they're not afraid to document Canada as it actually is, as opposed to this idyllic version of Canada during the summer. So a lot of their paintings were painted during the winter that feature snow and maybe less than uh, ideal conditions. Although, you know, I'm, there's a lot of Canadians who say there's nothing wrong with a little snow, right? That's that's a big part of Canadian identity. But again, it's maybe not the thing that, that brings in the tourists, even though I think, you know, a, a fresh snow on a Sunday morning and you can see your breath and you go outside for a walk and it's dead quiet is really one of the most beautiful experiences you've ever had. And if you've never been to let's say Lake Louise and skated on the lake in the middle of winter, man, you are missing one of the great bucket list items that you could ever have. Uh, okay, and just lastly, I just want to close with this. Um, so this is the design that uh, A.Y. Jackson submitted for, a, for uh, an alternative version of the Canadian flag. So prior to 1964, the Canadian flag featured the the um, the Union Jack, the, essentially the the British flag, and that you know even to this day Canada has the Queen of England or now the the, the King of England on the back of its money, uh, coins, etc. Um, and there was a big Union Jack on the Canadian flag. In the 1960s, there's what they called the Great Canadian Flag Debate, where there was a lot of debate as to maybe is it time for Canada to grow up and have our own flag? And this is the flag that A.Y. Jackson submitted. And uh, many people consider this as the inspiration for the flag that Canada now has, which you see over which shoulder that shoulder and behind there right so you have the the union jack right next to the canadian flag there right which only has one maple leaf uh instead here um ay has three maple leaves and then there's the the there's water on the top and on the bottom symbolizing the east and west coasts of canada coast to coast of course, there is also the Arctic Ocean as well. Um, obviously, this this was not the his his proposal for the Canadian flag was not accepted, but I do think this uh, this sort of summarizes his um, uh, in in a way is 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 symbolic of A. Y. Jackson's feelings about the importance of developing a unique Canadian identity and featuring the British flag on the Canadian flag all kind of in his mind prevented Canada from really becoming and uh, and standing up on its own feet as just like uh, had happened in Canadian art for so long so he, he makes he submits this obviously the Canadian flag was picked uh, a year later the one that we now know but also the next year after that A.Y. Jackson suffers a stroke and is essentially, you know, his, his painting career comes to an end. He does live for another nine years after this and dies in 1974. Um, during that time, he spends uh, a lot of, uh, he becomes sort of like an artist in residence in Kleinberg, Ontario, or Kleinberg. And Kleinberg is also where they have the McMichael Art Collection which is really the, the best art collection. If you're interested in seeing art by A.Y. Jackson, the other group of seven members, that National Gallery in Ottawa and the Art Gallery of Ontario and Toronto are your three best places to see 
A.Y. Jackson paintings. Okay, so let's get to painting. I, I know people are restless and want to paint, so let's, uh, let's move on here. So... And I'm, there's lots of stories because I've I've read pretty much everything there is about A. Y. Jackson to to talk about. So I'll just sort of try to incorporate some of that into uh, the 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 as we paint today. So often what we we do, especially with our more complex paintings, is do a little bit of underpainting. And underpainting is really just painting some of outlines or where some of the shapes are going to go. But I think we can just skip that step for this painting and just go launch right into the to the artwork. So let's go to our background pass number one. As I say, we're going to start with the background, then we're going to go to the foreground, work on the foreground for a bit, come back to the background, finish it off, move to the foreground, finish that off, and then we'll be all done. So what do we need to do here? Um, our first step for our background is we're going to apply a little bit of, uh, of, um, kind of a bit of a purpley color into the sky here. So let's get some paint on our palette. Oops. And do just that. read while I'm doing doing this. Um, uh, Nikki says I would love for you to check it out and give your feedback over there. What what are you what uh, are you talking about Nikki? Your feedback over where? Did I miss something? Uh, I once a month I give uh, free feedback to people here on the YouTube channel. Um, so if you've uploaded your artwork to the Facebook group, I'll uh, I'll incorporate it into our next ep feedback episode, which will be in two weeks. So make sure you include your work there. Okay, just gonna. Spoon a little bit of this warm red out. This was in a tube that um, is almost empty, but you know you can get a lot of paint out of these tubes even after it seems like you can't squeeze any more drops out of there. Oops. Okay, so there's all my colors on my palette now. Uh, Pascal says this piece should be at the AGO according to the internet. Yeah. Uh, oft, I've, I've noticed the AGO and the National Gallery sometimes will list paintings by Canadians that aren't necessarily in their collection for some reason on I don't sometimes it's because they've been exhibited at the museum but aren't a formally part of their collection I, I noticed that uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York also does that I don't know what the purpose of that is but anyway it's just checking to see if that's dry it looks like it's nice and dry so let's stir some paint up and let's even So the color that, I, actually, just as a quick thing, the color that I want to use here for our background, uh, I'm going to mix a, a fairly kind of muted purple. I'm going to use some warm red and cool blue. Or actually, maybe I'll, I'll, maybe not. That might be a little bit too dull. That's going to that's gonna get me too close to a black. So I'm going to use a cool red and cool blue. And this is going to give me a purple that's that's going to be a cold purple. 
and it's not going to have the the intensity of one of these purples which are made with warm blue and cool red so it's just going to be a slightly more muted and a little bit more cool so that it sits further into the background because cold colors recede warm colors advance towards us right so it's in our best interest to have colder colors in the background so i'm going to take my cool red and my warm blue i'm going to mix these two fellows up together right here and you know if i look at that color that's pretty close but the thing is that that's also way too dark and it's way too intense so what i want to do is i'm going to take some white and mix in that into my color let's just see so that's pretty good the one thing is let's just mix it all up the one thing is is it might be actually a little bit too purple I think I want something that's a little bit more blue. So let's put a bit more blue back in here. So we'll have a blue purple. And how's that? I think it's still maybe a little bit dark. So let's put a bit more white in here. I think that's pretty close. Okay. So I'm just gonna use a big brush and I'm not worried about getting um, the color totally perfectly mixed in here. And I'm just gonna take my brush and maybe I'll just show you another view as well. So I'm just almost kind of like just dragging my brush very lightly. Like see how I'm holding the brush kind of higher up and I'm just kind of dry brushing as I go across here. All right, maybe I'll just do a bit of bit of an outline let's back up even over here And all these brush strokes are also going on a diagonal, right, as well. Okay, just dipping a bit more paint in and going back over this edge. My goal is not just to slap on a whole bunch of thick, heavy paint here. I'm trying to um, just, I want kind of a little bit of a fade here. And notice how I'm kind of just painting over these lines here. I'm not worried about 
going over top of that because I'm going to paint a really dark horizon line right over top of all that. Okay. That's pretty good for right now. I'm just going to... I still got lots of paint on my brush. I'll just wipe that off of my palette. Uh, the White Wasabi. Hello, White Wasabi. When you're planning to do the next viewer art, it should be in two weeks from now. So not this weekend, but the weekend after. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add like this kind of lime green in the, or sorry, uh, let's go to this view. We're going to add the lime green into the Aurora Borealis in the sky here. So really to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to use, I'll just go back. So I'm going to use my cool yellow and my cool blue, as well as a little bit of white here. So let's just, I'm going to rotate that around. So we're going to take our cool yellow and cool blue. It's okay if there's a little bit of other like red or anything in there, that's okay. Now the blue is gonna change my yellow really quickly. So I just wanna be careful about putting too much in too quickly because it's a lot easier to darken this and make it a deeper green than it is to lighten or, to, yeah. So let's just start with that. Now that's really, really intense lime color. So we're gonna put some white in it and white is gonna tint it and mute it, right? When we add white to a color, we tint a color. And as even though this is really intensely lime color, I'm actually gonna use a little bit of this just like this because you can kind of see there is a little bit of it right on that edge there. So I'm just gonna keep, uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep this big brush like this. And I'm gonna kind of go back over this and this time I'm kind of brushing away that way it's gonna kind of fade a little bit as I paint. And it might even mix into some of the paints that are there. Let's put a bit of this. So as I'm doing this, I'm not really concerned about getting the, about getting it right. I just want to get this color in place. And there's also a little bit of this in the water. So I'm just going to put this right along down here. Pretty good. Just soften that up a little bit. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. Um. Let's do a little bit more in the sky, and then we'll move on. This time I'm actually going to switch down to a little bit of a smaller brush. And I'm going to, let's take some white and put this back into this mixture. This time I'm going to add more blue in here. And you can see it starts to go kind of teal-like. And, you know, ideally we want to have a, a few different versions of this teal in the painting. Um, so this is a color that, that we see probably most strongly in here. So I'm kind of doing like a dry brush as I go over here. And notice how there's even a little bit of this yellow coming through on those edges. I'm going to try to preserve that if possible. So what I've got is I've got, you know, that yellow that I applied as my imprimatura. That's there at the very bottom, and it's kind of shining through a little bit. Some people will like that. Some people don't like that. It's just um, no problem. It's up to you. Uh, but I do think it just, again, it gives that just extra little bit of layer of light that's coming through here. So... And so as I'm just doing this, I'm just thinking, I just want to make sure these are going in the right direction or they're not sort of changing path here because all my pencil lines are pretty much covered at this point, right? Um, well, let's do that again. So a bit more white. Let's just bring a bit more blue in here. Make this a little bit of a deeper teal, bit more of a blue teal, and just do the same thing. Notice that it's not exactly like the original yet. I'm going to, I'm not I'll, I'll shape it in the next pass that I go through the, the sky here. So that's not for this stage. That's for the, what I'll do afterwards. Giving a little bit more of that color down here at the bottom. good good enough for right now uh, 
Uh, Glass Lemon says, did you make it into basic shapes first? Uh, not, not with the paintings. Um, you could, like, I'm assuming maybe you're talking about drawing and some of the, 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 uh, the methods that I talk about in the drawing courses. And yes, if we were to sketch this all out from scratch, you know, I, I would probably, well, you don't really, I mean, there's, this is not really that complex of a composition that we would need to break it into shapes. I mean, maybe I would put a rectangle here, a thin rectangle line there, and maybe some diagonals here, and then kind of maybe break them up into a little bit more jagged lines. But, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I chose this painting. Not only do I really like it, but I think it's something that's, that, so straightforward that that even in someone who has very little experience with drawing could sketch this type of thing out um, onto a, a canvas. But good question. I appreciate that. Okay. I think that's okay for, for me to move on to a new step here. So, uh, let's, let's go into the foreground here. So now that we've got the background begun, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's just barely established and we're going to do more work on it. In, um, after we, we go on to this next step, let's, uh, let's start putting in the hills and the water. I, I think there's water down here in the bottom and some of these rocks and things. So our next step here is we're gonna to want to paint like a really dark, almost black. So we're gonna use, we're basically gonna mix a black and then um, we're gonna make it look a little bit more greenish, maybe a little bit more brown, etc. So where's our image? Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll just, yeah. So we're gonna mix like a, like a greenish brown for these hills back here or greenish black and then a reddish black for the foreground so to make a black we want to mix our cool blue where should we do this let's do this right here take our cool blue I think we might need a little bit more. So to make our, our black, we're going to take our cool blue and our warm red and mix that together. And actually... That's much closer to the color for the hills in the foreground. It's kind of like an eggplant color. So you know what, I'm just gonna use, yeah, let's just use this color right here and we'll mix a separate color for the, the other one. Um, oops. So. So, so this is not a, a black, that's, this is like a really, really dark purple. Because I didn't even put any yellow into it. I am going to make this darker and actually paint black over top of it later on. But not just yet. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of the, the sky that I didn't go right up to the edge. Um... What do I want to do there? Maybe should I make that hill a bit more prominent? I'll leave it like that. And then I can always add more to it later. So I'm just going to get some of this off. Uh, now I'm going to take a bit of this paint here. Let's put it over here. 
And now I'm going to mix a lot of yellow into this. This is how we would make a black, but I want this to be more of a greenish black. So right now, that's, that's a really lovely, cool brown. Let's take a bit more blue in here, though. And that blue is going to turn this much more into a green, greenish black. And... I just made that hill a lot bigger than it is. That's okay. And actually, just using the back of my paintbrush to scrape some of this paint off. Give a little bit of that yellow coming through there. Um, it's a little bit transparent, but again, I'm going to paint a, maybe a little bit more of that color or darken it later on anyway. I just have to wait for it to dry. Okay. So again, I'm just going to wipe off. that excess paint. Uh, Posh Colleen says, Good night, I'll watch the rest when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> Good night. I'm impressed people who tune in to these episodes in the middle of the night on the other side of the planet. That just blows my mind. That's so cool. I appreciate um, that people have, are so into painting that they're willing to stay up a little bit later to, to watch. Okay, so now let's do the foreground. We're going to work a little bit on the water, but mostly in these... Uh, this kind of blue here and this kind of bluish green underneath underlying this but remember we want our warm colors in the front just as we use our cool colors in the background so most of these colors are cool um, um, dominant or are entirely made of cool colors where we want our warmest colors to be in the foreground so what we're going to do is we're going to take our warm blue and our warm yellow and let's mix those two together and we're going to get this pretty uh, deep green maybe we want a, a little bit more blue in there So if we look at these together, we now have this like, um, it's it's a blue, it's a deep blue green, and it's a warm uh, bluish green. And I'm gonna paint this all around down here. Some people will try to paint, a, like put a bunch of different colors from the sky and paint all those little dots down on the bottom but then you got to paint all around that and that you know there's you it's there's lots of artists who would do stuff like that but boy oh boy that's going to take you a long time and honestly this i think is not only going to go way faster to paint that over top of this but it's also going to just look a little bit cleaner a little bit less 
um, fiddly. And nothing against fiddle players or fiddle music, but um, I want my painting to look as effortless as possible. That's something that you know artists have kind of generally strive for. You kind of want to make it look like it was it's easy to do. Okay. So I think, I think that might be okay for just that stage. So I'm just looking at it. I think, I think I'm happy with where I'm at right now. And you know, when, when I look at these side by side at this stage, it, it looks maybe to, to some people that I'm way, way, way off, right? People are like, that's not the right color for the sky. That's not the right color for the hills. That's not the right color for the foreground. Ah, it, it isn't right now, but it will be. You know, it's the same sort of thing if somebody walking into a kitchen and just sticking their finger, taking a bite out of a steak and being like, what do you, what's this? This steak's not right, it's not cooked. This is gross. And you'd say, yeah. I'm still cooking it. Get out of the kitchen! <laughs> what are you doing taking a bite out of a, the, my food before it's ready? All right, so we're seeing this painting in its half-cooked, half-finished state at the moment. Okay. Um, I might just quickly blow-dry this before I move on, because I got some kind of thick paint down here, so I just want to make sure that's not going to get caught up in the next layer of paint. So I'm going to mute this briefly. Okay, so next step here. So we've now uh, established background and foreground. The first pass has been completed. Now we're gonna go, we're gonna finish our background. Then when we're done that, we're gonna finish the foreground and we're gonna be done. So this is also gives us a little bit of an idea of the process that these artists use. The all the members of the group of seven, including Emily Carr and Tom Thompson, painted in this very fast, uh, wet on wet approach to painting. They're painting all of them with uh, oil paint, so they're often painting all in one sitting. Sometimes while they're on location with a small canvas sitting on their lap outdoors in in the rain and the snow and the great thing with oil paint is because it has it's oil based you can paint in all sorts of extreme weather it can be raining on your canvas and the water will because it doesn't absorb into the uh, oil paint it just sort of runs off so uh, but when you're outdoors and you're painting in the rain or at night you got to work quickly so they are, there's a, a, a kind of a speed to this type of painting that we want to continue to em, um, embrace and embody as we're working here. So let's go back to the painting and let's put them side by side just so you can see where we're at. So what I want to do now is I'm going to add a little bit more um, uh, cool blue into the background over top of some of this purple because I got a lot of purple uh, but now I want m much more of a cool
cool blue in that area. So, and it, I'm also, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to add, actually add a little bit of my clear matte medium to this mixture so that I don't completely hide everything I've just done. I'm just modifying it, right? It's sort of like my dad who used to put water into the ketchup <laughs> growing up uh, to save a few dollars on ketchup, right, Dad? You know, it was just a... <laughs> You know, just make it go a little bit further and I mean you know ketchup is a pretty strong flavor so you want to kind of uh, um, you don't want it to overpower anything <laughs> uh, there were times where you know I think there was a, a point in my life where I thought ketchup was um, was uh, had the consistency of water <laughs> <laughs> Turns out ketchup is, uh, when I would go to other people's houses, their ketchup was much thicker. Anyway, all kidding aside, um, I've now mixed this, this cold blue with a little bit of the previous purple into this mixture. And because I've added that matte medium in here, it's going to be way more transparent. So, let's bring these two back up here. So I'm going to go the other way. And again, my goal is not to cover up all this purple. Now the other thing too, now this is where I'm going to be looking at my image and trying to trying to kind of start to shape the 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 rays of the the aurora borealis here because I'm bringing some of the sky in here. And I can also, when I'm going to go back into these rays back over top, but um, this is my opportunity to try to kind of get a little bit closer to the original now. Not that it, that's kind of a main priority of mine, but... Um, So you can kind of see how this color behaves, and I just paint it right over top of that yellow. You can still see a lot of that yellow coming through. right down and through, doesn't it, to kind of give a fold effect. So we're kind of modifying not just the purple that was in behind, but also even a little bit of the the rays of the aurora borealis as well.
So now I've actually just taken a bit more, what I did is I took a little bit of, of just blue on its own, mixed a bit in here, and now I'm just trying to, you know, you can see in this area right there, that's where I am, just kind of being much more bold in that area. Again, so this is I'm starting to shape this a bit here, right? Let's take a bit more of this warm red now. I'm going to put that into here. It's going to give me a deeper purple, right? Basically what we did here, but we just added a lot of white to it. I want to have a darker blue here. And in this instance, this blue is going to get a little bit purpley. Not everywhere. So you can see that just really starts to add a lot of depth into that sky. Now I still have a little bit of matte medium in here that's just making it a little bit more transparent. Again, you don't have to use that, but I always find it's just it's it does help to to 
uh, especially if you're a little bit more of a timid painter you can put a lot of matte medium and things and you can just sort of very slowly build up layers without worrying that you're gonna completely cover things Maybe I'm just going to do a few even smaller ones. Where do we have like a line that comes down? Yeah, my lines somehow got a little bit <laughs> crooked there. That's okay. That's okay. It's interesting. It looks like it almost gets a little bit darker in here. So let's get a bit of that darker. Okay, that looks pretty good. It kind of bums me out that, is that too late to change? It's not too late to change, but you know what? I'm just going to leave it there anyway, because um, we don't need to make it perfect, right? Uh, Bus Gusta says, I tuned in live and direct. Give thanks. Nice work, my friend. <laughs> and my mother just typed said, Your uh, dad still waters down the ketchup. Oh, my goodness. I remember my dad went through a period of making ketchup sandwiches. Literally putting ketchup onto plain bread and eating them. That, w he, that was a diet he had going for a while. Which, as gross as it sounds, actually is not that bad. It kind, kind of kind of got a thing for it. Anyway. <laughs> let's, uh, let's finish off the, the, the aurora in the sky before we move to the foreground. So now we're just going to use maybe a little bit more intense colors. I'm going to go to... Uh, my a smaller brush. Let's add a little bit more white in here. So we've got our cool yellow and our cool blue. So at first I'm going to use maybe as less 
white so I can get some little bit of a darker areas in. And I'm also going to now paint in the opposite direction. So they're kind of fading out as they go up into the sky here. So we sort of like have a little extra little ridge in behind here that that's really beautiful what he's done there that is pretty tricky so he's he's got like this more prominent ridge and then the reflection of it kind of a little bit in behind so trying to build that that's that is nice that's that would be probably the most difficult part of this painting I'm not going to try to spend too much time doing that because that could end up taking me a lot longer. But you see there's kind of like that little bit of a dark area and I'm kind of just painting a bit there. We're going to come back with a little bit of yellow here in a minute. Okay, so now let's take some white. I'm gonna take some cool yellow, mix that in here. So I, I didn't wash my brush. I still got a little bit of green quality to this yellow, which is totally fine and to be expected. Maybe even want a bit more yellow. We can also take a brush, I haven't done this in a while, it's like using just a dry brush as a blending brush, just to soften things out. You wanna use a, a, a dry, kind of fluffier brush for that.
So I'm just kind of just dry brushing all of this in here. And I'm not covering up all my yellow that was there before that I left coming through. I'm just adding a bit, a bit more to it. The best thing is when the brush starts to get a little bit dry, as opposed to like using wet paint on your brush. Like you can literally, if to paint in a dry brush technique, you can get paint on your brush and wipe excess paint off on a cloth and then paint onto your canvas. What I tend to kind of do is I'll get, I, you can do that or sometimes I'll just use that that paint and kind of apply it where I might not, where I'm, I'm happy having a little bit more of a globs of that paint. And then as I continue painting, the paintbrush just naturally gets a little bit drier. these these kind of diagonal shapes coming up like waves going in front of all this That also just allows me to clean up any brush strokes and things.
It almost looks like that's a bit of a palette knife he might have used in some of these places. It's hard to tell. I think that needs more yellow. So I'm just kind of doing like little impressionist little blobs of paint here with different colors. It's pretty close. Getting that kind of candy color in there is kind of tricky, but. All right, and then I can also just take my brush blend a bit of this together Bob Ross style I don't know, I think that's getting pretty close. Maybe the only thing I might wanna do just quickly before I move on from that is I'm gonna make a bit more of this sky color. And then I might just bring a bit back Okay, so I think that's pretty good enough for good enough for the sky. So let's go to our final step here. And so now, you know, I'm I'm pretty satisfied with the sky. That is, it's pretty tricky to do exactly like A. Y. Jackson did. There's a reason why he's considered to be one of the greatest Canadian artists of all time. So you know, we do the best we can, and then we're gonna move down to the bottom. So, for that, what we want to do 
is maybe just refine the hills just a little bit. Um, you know what? I think I can get away with, if my paint is still a little bit wet here, rather than mix a black for that, I think I can... I have any more cold blue around? try to like ah, I want to get this done without having to resort to more paint but I take this cold blue and my cold yellow will make something that's very close to black here substituted my cool yellow and we got a black there I'm not gonna put this everywhere I'm gonna put it mostly over top of everything but I'm gonna keep a little bit of that especially of uh, the little bit more of the brownish color underneath especially on the edges so that it kind of kind of shines through as like a halo of that darker color and that's good I mean I could if I wanted I could paint a little bit more I could do another layer I'm also going to try to shape this and just get that a little bit tinier there we go That might be good enough for that hill. I think that's about as dark as I need it to go. So the last thing is let's go down here in the bottom and let's take our warm blue. I'm gonna take some cool yellow. This is gonna give us a much more saturated purple, a much warmer purple. I'm gonna put this over top of this green. Again, my priority is not to hide that. I like having that there. I just want those colors to mix. Right, so now that water just is like, whoa, that is intensely like fluorescent color, even though we don't we don't have any fluorescence, right? It's just the opposition of that color um, next to other colors is what gives it that look. So I'm just gonna go back here. Let's just take some of these colors. Let's see. You know, I think I do need a little bit. You know what? Let's let's do it with warm yellow. It's going to be a slightly different kind of green, but you know we should be using warm colors in the foreground anyway. So we can take our warm yellow and warm uh, blue. And we can get a color that's similar to this, not maybe as icy, but it's warmer. And just 
Just ground that a little bit there. Let's take a bit of this previous color that was there. Let's get a bit of more cool blue in here, actually. And you know what? I'm going to use a much smaller brush, too. And now what I'm doing is I'm just doing some kind of diagonal lines, just like he did. So I'm, you know, kind of spacing them out kind of randomly. Okay. And then I'm just going to use these the same color to put some dots down here. So when I'm doing little dots like this, I try to uh, do it as randomly as possible. So I kind of move around, rather than sort of doing them in a line, otherwise you'll tend to create lines for yourself. And don't be afraid to touch the edge. This is zoom out. Okay. Oops. Um, what we can do is uh, just mix slightly different variations on this color. May even take, actually, let's do a little bit with some warm yellow. The same color we, we mixed a little bit earlier that we put down there. So we just want as many different kind of variations. I, I'm not exactly sure if this is water or if this is like a beach and rocks on there or like the reflections on white caps of water. Like these could be two different bodies of water that are 
intersecting here. Anyone who's ever taken the, the ferry from Vancouver to Victoria or Vancouver Island, because if you pass um, through what they call the Georgia Strait, and, and um, you, there's often different bodies of water that are colliding, and, and you, can, you can literally see the, the two different, like where they meet, and it is quite a stunning visual to see that. So that's what, you know, I imagine maybe that's what's going on here, I don't know. Pretty close. Um, I do think maybe. Oops. Uh, maybe what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of this color that I used for my background. I'm gonna add just a little bit of white to it. So this is the the purple that I put down here. Adding just a little bit of white to it to make some purpley spots. I mean, you could put all sorts of colors down here, and, and by all means, if you feel inspired to put reds and oranges and greens, you should feel absolutely free and um, you have my permission to go wild. So this one I got maybe a little bit more white on than I wanted. But instead of just pushing it away, I'm going to use it in a few places. And just kind of go back to one that's a little bit darker. Because we want that variety. Hmm. I think maybe do I want... Do I want a little bit more cool yellow and teal down in that water, I think.
So I'm kind of just painting in between some of these lines. Not all of them. So I'll just show you now if I zoom back out. That's pretty close. You know what? Let's um, okay. I think we're almost done here. We're just time for a little bit of finishing touches, and then and then we'll wrap up. So. Let's look at these two paintings side by side and just uh, diagnose what potential changes we might want to make. So one thing is, is I'm looking at my sky and I feel like I could darken this purple by actually adding a warm blue over top of it, which is a little bit different than what we would normally do. Because, you know, generally we want to keep our cool colors in the background, warm colors in the foreground. It does look like he's got a little bit of, like, ultramarine blue in that sky. I am very leery to do that. Uh, mostly just because it, uh, it just is going to take me a little bit more time. And it might be a little bit more advanced of a technique. So, I'm just always trying to balance how close do I want to get to the original versus how much is, is too much for a beginner painter. Um, so, you know, if I look at that again, I think I'm actually going to go in the opposite direction. I think what I'm going to do is... I'm actually going to put some more cool blue up into the sky, which is, again, this, that's not what he did, but I just have a, a yearning for more cool blue. Do I have any more cool blue? And I think that's just going to push the sky a little bit further back. So I'm not just putting it in intensely on its own. I'm just mixing it in with a little bit of the colors that were previously there. So this is like, you know, when you're making your own paintings, sometimes you've got to make them your own. And don't be afraid to, to step out a little bit and and change it and just I feel like I want it to be darker uh, to make more of a contrast it's also the more the more contrast we have in the sky the more these northern lights are going to like really glow the the less contrast we have in there the more they're just going to kind of the less life they're going to have and it's, you know, exactly what he's done. He's just used more of an ultramarine blue here. So I'm putting in um, my cool blue. Also because this is what I've been teaching people is using cooler colors in the background.
And so this is pretty subtle, but it is having a bit more of that intended effect of just creating more contrast. I mean, let's let's just see. Just for it's my painting, I can experiment and do whatever I want. I'm gonna, I will take a little bit of my warm blue, and let's see if we can. See, that's pretty dark, but actually, that's kind of nice. Yeah, maybe that's what I needed. It's a little bit of that warm blue up here. Surprise, surprise. The master knew what they were doing, right? I mean, warm blue is a darker blue than cool blue, almost in... Well, not in every case, but um, at least in the palette that we have here. Okay. Now is that too dark? Let's just take a rag and see if I can smudge that a bit. Maybe it is a bit dark. Let's just go back to a little bit of a lighter color. I think that's good enough for government work. So, I think it's time for a quick side-by-side -side comparison to check them out. They are a little bit different, but that's okay. And if yours is a little bit different, that's okay too. So maybe just before we do that, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you found any of this interesting or useful, please consider joining the Facebook group. Uh, uploading a picture of your finished artwork to the Facebook group or even one that's not finished and if you want a little bit of pointers from many of the great artists that are already a part of that group or from myself in two weeks I'll do a feedback episode where I'll take a look at everyone's art that's on the Facebook group as well as you can leave a donation as little as a dollar through the PayPal or YouTube super chat or you can contact me through the website or Facebook groups so how did things turn out well hmm I think as always my paintings tend to be a little bit more bright and colorful than the originals um, and that's not something you know I'm gonna apologize for that's just sort of my own way of of working and the my my personal style 
And as I just go in here and start modifying things, I start to see little differences. Maybe I should have just left well enough alone, right? Let's see if I can just scrub a bit of that off. Let's try that again. Okay, but now I'm just going to stop painting. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think his color that he used back here was it was even more um, of a kind of a, a muted purple than what I've got. Mine, I kind of kept punching it up, getting more and more saturated colors. So my painting overall just has a more intensely colored uh, um, quality than his. Um, let's zoom in. This is a little bit hard to do because the original is such a low quality um, reproduction there, but we kind of get an idea. You know, he's really got way more little shapes and subtleties there, which I don't have, but that's not something I'm too concerned about. Let's go right to the bottom left corner here. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we got the, the hills and I think those colors are pretty close. You know, my water down here is a lot more green and kind of fluorescent green, lime green colors. Even some of the spots down here are a little bit more candy-like than his. They don't quite have the subtlety of his, but, you know, that's just... That's just the difference between two different artists and how they w will approach things. Um, I do like that we've got a, just that little bit of yellow kind of around the edge of the horizon line there. Just give it a little bit of the light, the, the sun on the other side of the hills. And you know, I could have put a little bit of pink in there, quite honestly. In fact, is this just crazy to mix a little bit of white, a little bit of red in here, warm red, so I get a bit of yellow. So I just took some warm yellow, or mostly warm red, a little bit of warm yellow, and I mean, that, that actually works nice, too. That, that contrast of the pink and the blue, I think, also helps. Okay. So, once again, another finished painting. Thank you, everyone, for painting along with me tonight. I hope you have a wonderful evening wherever you are on our beautiful planet. Next week, we're going to be painting a painting by Lauren Harris. 
the uh, the artist the, the the who's created the most expensive paintings in Canadian art history and his sort of biggest champion is the actor Steve Martin we'll talk all about why it is Steve Martin like a Canadian painter who died 50 years ago we'll get all into that we're gonna paint a, one of his beautiful mountainscapes and uh, yeah, we're going to continue our, our look at the Group of Seven and Canadian artists. And then the week after, we're looking at Mary Bracamond, one of the great uh, French Impressionist painters. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of stuff coming down the, the horizon. Like, subscribe, so that and you can also see some of the future videos that are posted in the playlist as well. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again in a future episode. I can't wait to see your paintings up on the on the the Facebook group. Have a great night, everybody.